The following podcast contains spoilers and words like cr- and gosh d- Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Hello, ladies and germs. How y'all doing? You've got Billy, you've got Topher, and that means, as always, you're listening to We Watched A Thing. It's beautiful to be here with you tonight, mate. How you doing? Oh, glorious as always, sir. How about yourself? <laughs> mate, I'm top of the world. Got a haircut today, so I'm feeling, feeling feisty, you know? I was going to... I, I thought it looked shorter. Um, it was I was going to say something about it, and then it immediately became <laughs> just not important enough. <laughs> it was getting a little bit on the long side, you know? It was making me sleepy. I don't know if you forget that. When my hair is too long and it gets in my eyes and stuff, it just it makes me feel quite sleepy all the time. Right. <laughs> Well, you could tend to have an extra for gravity to work with. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Just more weighing me down, you know. (laughs) But we're not here to talk about haircuts today. This isn't we cut our hair. This is we watched a thing. So, though that uh, would be a glorious podcast. Obviously, I'll put it on the list of possible spinoffs. What thing did we watch this week, my friend? This week we watched uh, current Oscar contender Judas and the Black Messiah. That is correct. Judas and the Black Messiah, 2021 American biographical drama film about the betrayal of Fred Hampton, chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party in the 60s. It stars Daniel Kaluuya, Lakeith Stanfield, Jesse Plemons, Dominique Fishback, Ashton Sanders, Daryl Bitt Gibson, Lil Rail Howery, Algie Smith, Dominique Thorne, and Martin Sheen. I won't ask you what it's about because I, I said that at the start. <laughs> so you shall did. we, you shall we dive into it then? Love to, sir. What Oscars is this up for again? Is it up for Best Picture? It is up for Best Picture. Uh, it has two two nominations in Supporting Actor. Um, so people be liking it, mm. to be sure. Absolutely. All right. Um, I mean, kick us off, mate. How, how did you find the film? Um, I like this film. Okay. I definitely like this film. I don't know that I like it as much as the people that I had kn- that I knew about the film through, um, but that should not take away from the fact that I like this movie. Um, and centered particularly on not just I mean the two central performances are fantastic. Yeah, the cast the cast in general. Yeah, is just a I mean that's for me. That's the real hook of the film, is yeah. the performances. I can't believe that you said that. The reason I asked up front, what did you think of it, is I, I never expected you to give that answer. I was certain that you were going to have enjoyed this film a lot more than I did. It sounds like we're basically lockstep. I liked this film. That's that's about where I am on it. I agree with you. The cast is sensational. Not just the central two performances. Jesse Plemons, brilliant in this film. Martin Sheen, really great, but those two lead performances really I agree with you. That to me is is what this film is. Um Yeah, and there's I mean, even with um like Dominique Fishback's character, which you could very easily be and okay, she doesn't it, it's it's not her story. It's not like they devote that much time to her, but she she gives that character just more meat than you otherwise might get in the, you know, quote unquote, the wife role. Yep. Um, she's fantastic. Um, the casting of of Sheen as as Hoover is, I mean, it's almost kind of a, just a a mean thing to do to the audience because he's just like <laughs> he, like Sheen is just such a decent human. That like it's almost a body blow watching him be this absolute prick, and it's also because you've seen him play such a wonderful president in the West Wing for so long. It's almost like reverse typecasting. I actually think it's really smart, and I I think that he does a really great job of it. I think, yeah, he's excellent. Um, but most of the talk, um, in this film, and I would argue rightly so, has been. On Lakeith Stanfield and Daniel Kaluuya, they are both, they are sensational. Like, Kaluuya is absolutely expected 
to win supporting actor for this film. Yeah. Um, As not he hard should. to see. Not hard to see why. Like one, yeah. he's absolutely fantastic. Two of the two of them, he's doing he's doing bigger things. Yeah. It's it's more acting with a capital A. Yeah. I was uh, and so like I expected him to be absolutely brilliant in the film. Quite frankly, um, where and Stanfield, I expected to be very good because Lakeith Stanfield is very good. Um, I I was pleasantly surprised by just how good Stanfield is because he's he's it's just a lower key role yeah so he kind of has to do more with less but he doesn't try and do too much with it as well um and there's times where he has to and I I, I really love actors who can who can pull this off well when they have to say one thing and mean another and yeah. just pull that off flawlessly and he has to do that a bunch in this film I think Stanfield is Fucking fantastic. Yeah. Agreed. And I think both of them, there's no shortage of, you know, Oscar snippets, I think, in this film. You could just about hit skip 30 seconds at any point in this film and find yourself in the middle of a beautifully written monologue piece, particularly from Kaluuya. Just about every scene has at least 15 seconds of speech from him that is like, holy shit, that's powerful. Um, And it, it is- Amazing. Much, much like um, Denzel Washington's win for Malcolm X. Oh, wait. <laughs> and it is amazing just how present this film feels. You know, like you look at the events of the last year and it's almost- Last week. Well, yeah. And it's almost scary that this is a film, you know, set in the 60s when, when this was obviously- a huge problem, and it's so easy, particularly I find in Australia, it's very easy to walk around forgetting that this is still a huge problem. But it is, and I think it's a very powerful film. Because here in Australia, we have absolutely no issues with race relations at all. No, well, sorry. <laughs> not not quite we, what I was saying. Not after we swept that under the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> we are good at sweeping things. <laughs> Um, you mentioned Jesse Plemons, um, who I love. Big, big Plemons fan. Um, not the best law enforcement person he's ever played. That, of, that of course, is Game Night. <laughs> Which, I mean, if it's not my favourite performance of the last 10 years, it's pretty fucking close. Yeah. it's But, it's- um, but yeah, Matt, Matt Damon's less attractive brother, still doing very good things. He does look a lot like Damon. It's funny, you know, if this cast wasn't already so stacked with those lead two performances, I would actually have Plemons up for supporting this year because I think that for me anyway, the scenes with him are some of the best in the film, really. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily him. I'll get into later what issues I did have with the film and why I didn't love it as much as I was expecting to. But I really, really loved what his character and his performance brought to it. He'll get his makeup Oscar one day for his work on Game Night. <laughs> the first time, so like you know, I mentioned this film's up for Best Picture at the Oscars. It is, I believe, the first film ever that has multiple producers uh, that are all African American. I stand really? to be corrected on that. Is that a but true I think, fact? I think so. And like I said, I do stand to be corrected, but I think that is the case. Um, Ryan Coogler is one of the producers of this film, and that it, it's really interesting. Like, what what is Coogler going to do with the next 10, 20 years of his career? Because he's got such cachet at the moment, like such yeah. clout on from both a critical and commercial. That's exactly standpoint right. Yeah, that it's interesting that he's not just going to. It's not just going to be like, all right, yeah, this is good. Look, I'm happy to direct this because that will help get it made, which undoubtedly, like you'd think, would be the case. Yeah. Um, but to to be identifying other talent that he's excited about um, and working with them as a producer um, has has just has got to be a good thing, surely, for getting a variety of of voices. Yeah. In in Western cinema. Yeah. Because Kugler at the moment, yeah, Kugler's got clout. 
Yeah, and deservedly so. I think he he really straddles that line very nicely of, as you said, commercialism and critical integrity. Like, when you look at even just his, you know, quite limited filmography, really. Like, it's not like he's got 10, 15 films under his belt. We're talking, what, six, maybe? <laughs> um. And, you know, you look at films like Fruitvale Station, a film that I think is one of the best films of the last 10 years. And then you look at what he's done with Creed and Black Panther as well. I agree. I think he's doing some really interesting things. So, yeah, to see him doing more producing and, as you say, getting some of those younger, fresher, newer voices out is, as you say, always a good thing. So the film was shot by Sean Bobbitt, who really, really good cinematographer. He's worked a lot with uh, Steve McQueen. Uh, he shot he shot Hunger. He shot Shame. He shot 12 Years a Slave. Uh, he did Widows, of course, with um, with maybe actually my favourite Daniel Kaluuya performance um, <laughs> in that film. Uh, now, that's a beautiful looking film too. Yeah. I mean, Bobbitt rules. He just rules. Um, and- well, I, there's a thing that he does, particularly early on with scenes with Hampton, um, that I think is great, where he's framed, like, Kaluuya is framed almost too tight in the frame, but given how um, how active he is while he's giving these speeches. And he keeps, like, he actually does kind of burst out of the frame occasionally, which I thought was actually a really cool choice to when we're introduced to this character he's this guy who the frame kind of literally can't contain yeah yep yeah the cinematography is great in this film this is one of those classic examples where it's not flashy it services the film extremely well but it's very understated and you could sit there and look at the composition of shots and go wow that's that's a really nice shot but there's nothing that especially catches you at the time you don't sit there and get drawn into the cinematography which is exactly how this film should be because what you should be focusing on is the dialogue and the performances and and being emotionally invested and the cinematography does a great job of just supporting that and getting you there i think as does the score big fan of the score for this film i gotta say it does a great job of setting the time i was gonna say it does feel time specific doesn't it yeah and i think that it's one of the few things that does which is actually a really nice touch this film doesn't go too deep into making the 60s a character i don't think there's a lot in this film that really makes you go oh, okay this is a period piece and i think that's a smart choice because as we said it's still a very present topic and a very present film so i like the fact that the score gives you that little kind of that vibe without them going too much into the production design and all that, because that would just distract to me. If you were sitting there going, oh, well, this is, you know, this was 50, 60 years ago. Like, this isn't this isn't relevant today. That would really take away from it. But they, they don't go into that, which I really appreciate. Mm. And, even, like, even in the writing, there is some, that, I mean, oh, like, it, it, it's not hard to place when the film is, even if, like me, you come into this film not knowing who Fred Hampton is, so not knowing exactly what year you're in. Yeah. Um, but there's some good, I think I think quite effective, not in your face script work to place you where like people will ask, um, at one point, Lakeith Stanfield's character, um, O'Neill, gets asked, how did you feel about Malcolm X's death? Which is good because it, it, it's this question that is designed to make Bill squirm and does. Like, it works for this kind of character reason, but it also is a kind of just neat and tidy way of saying Malcolm X's death is something that happened quite recently. Yeah. Yeah. There's been this kind of ongoing thing since the Oscar nominations came out, of course, since they're both up in the same category, whereas the- Really, the push was, I think, for Stanfield to be in lead because for people who who really like the film, you just don't want him pinching votes, if you like, off Kaluuya. Um, and so, I, I, that's one thing I was interested coming into the film was, like, where do I fall Yeah, on that? Um, and I think ultimately I do find it, ha- having Stanfield in either category- Neither one would feel to me like egregious category fraud. 
I think it is a I think it is a fairly fine line. Yeah. Ultimately, I think I probably do land on lead though because in any scene in any given scene involving both characters, you are far more likely to be viewing Fred Hampton from yeah. Bill's perspective rather than it being purely a Fred Hampton scene. And there's plenty of, there's plenty of scenes in the film that are Fred Hampton scenes. Plenty of them. There are, yeah. I, I actually yeah, I can't say that I would agree with you there. I that's interesting. That's an interesting take on it that you're seeing it from his perspective. Um I, I feel like there's so much Fred Hampton in this film. Yeah, I, I don't know where I stand there, actually. That's interesting. Because, <laughs> there's, like I said, there's plenty of scenes that are just Fred Hampton scenes that Bill is not in. Yeah. And this and this is not the case for every scene involving the two of them, but it was something I was really paying attention to because I just had that bit of interest about where would I have nominated Lakeith yeah. Stanfield. And there's a lot of scenes between the two of them where, where the viewpoint of the scene is, I think, unquestionably... Bill O'Neill, not Fred Hampton. It's a really interesting question because then you come back to the classic, you know, the the general screen time question because I don't think there's any argument that Fred ha- Fred Hampton has a lot more screen time than Lakeith Stanfield does. Whoa, I would be very interested to see someone get the stopwatch out on it'd, that. It'd be it'd be great to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> interesting to find out, and I th- I believe you and I are both on the same page here, that we don't mind films based on actual events taking artistic liberties. Like, yeah, fine, that's going to happen. It's not a documentary. You know, make your movie. I was shocked to find out that, like, Lakeith Stanfield is not old. I think he's, like, 29. Mm -hmm. Bill O'Neill was 17. Yeah. He, He was a child. Yeah. And, like, I and I don't think it makes... I don't think it makes it a better film. I don't necessarily think it makes it a worse film if Bill O'Neill in this film is clearly a 17-year-old. But it is a different film. Yes. Because I think it takes away some of the... In this film, Bill O'Neill really does make the choice to do what he does. Like, he's a grown-ass man. He can do his thing. If he's 17 and he's faced with an FBI person, well, you're... You're not even going to question it. It's not going to be like it's it's less about self service and more just oh shit I I have to do this. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. I agree. I agree with you completely that this this does spin that slightly differently. Even I believe it's at the end of the film during the title cards when it tells you that Fred Hampton was twenty one twenty one at the time of his death, and I, I had the exact same moment then where I was like, well, look, Daniel Kaluuya is brilliant in this film. But he's not 21. <laughs> and, he, like, usually I don't care about that, but I agree with you that it, it it would make you view the characters differently, I think. Jeez, I was not doing that at 21. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I was of no service to anyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 33 and I'm still barely of no service to anyone. <laughs> um, I was, I couldn't believe it when I saw that, that Hampton, that, that someone aged, I don't know when he became <laughs> chair of the Illinois chapter, but like, so before he was 21. Yeah. Holy shit. Mate, the number of outstanding people who are far younger than us is staggering. <laughs> Overachieving prick. <laughs> so there's one thing about this film that for me did bring it down a bit. And as I said, I. I thought I was going to love this film a lot more than I did. And I thought that you and I might actually disagree at the end of the film. I thought that you were going to absolutely hands down love it. And I thought that I might be the outlier being a little bit lower than you. And maybe I'm alone here. I feel that the writing of this film is both one of its best and weakest aspects. To me, there is there are some brilliantly written scenes in this film. Like I said earlier, there are, you could probably hit the skip button and you'd be in the middle of a great piece of dialogue. The issue for me, I think, is the way that it narratively comes together. I don't think you are as... Well, certainly I wasn't as emotionally invested in the film and the characters as I felt you should have been. I think that this is... This is a problem that can tend to happen with historical films. 
is that sometimes in the writing of there's a little bit of assumed knowledge. And as you said, you didn't know really anything about the characters or, or this story prior to, and maybe you felt differently than I did. I don't think there's, and this is this is a long film. This isn't short. They're not rushing through anything. But I reached a point in the film where I felt like it felt more like a collection of scenes rather than a flowing narrative to me. And it's like those scenes stand alone are all great and there's brilliant things to take out of all of them. But I wasn't emotionally carried through from each scene to the next. I didn't. And look, maybe that's the point. I'm I'm not particularly sure. But for me, it just didn't really work because I got to the end and I was like, I don't feel like I cared enough about these characters by the end of the film. Like they were saying great things. They were doing interesting things, but I don't feel like I was carried there. Did you feel the same way? I don't know if it's the screenplay or if it was the editing, but there was something that just didn't carry me properly from scene to scene in a narrative flow. I think when you say a collection of scenes, I think that's quite well put actually for my viewing experience yeah. as well. Um, I'd heard an interview with with the director before I'd watched the film where he talked about, you know, the idea was to make this kind of departed-esque sort of story um, to- and then kind of, you know, you, you Trojan horse in. Yeah. What and the film is really about is, is these characters and what they believed in and everything. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, great, great idea. Great thing to do. Um, it's it's a good thing that both the characters in the film and the performances in the film are so good. And that's what grips you. Because for me, like you, ultimately the story actually doesn't completely hold me. Yeah. Um, go, i got to say, like- the, the the departedness of it with the whole undercover thing um, as the way to get people to sit down and eat their vegetables just just isn't that compelling, quite frankly, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't feel that I was entertained enough for what it was trying to do. When you said that the director said that that's what he was going for, that makes complete sense to me because I did have parallels to The Departed while watching the difference is that during The Departed, you are so thoroughly entertained. Whereas with this, you're sitting there going, well, this is re- this is good, but I'm not, I can't say that I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> like, and that's not necessarily a problem, but I, I didn't feel that I was emotionally invested enough in the characters. I didn't, I don't feel that you got a full view enough of them, but that I really cared about what was happening to them. And I feel like in a movie like this where it is trying to really have that impact, I feel like that's something that's quite necessary. Yeah, and I, I would even say that for me, like not only like if you don't know who Fred Hampton is, then you're almost certainly not going to know who Bill O'Neill is. Um, I don't know who Bill O'Neill is. I, I would think, um, and not that I disliked this framing device, but the fact that it starts with a mock interview of Bill O'Neill clearly after the events of this film, I, I don't know that it helped my viewing experience that I'm like, well, I know Bill makes it out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I, I I often am not a fan of that kind of framing device where it's post-event interviews. It's something that they do quite often. And sometimes what will happen is the movie will catch up to that as like a halfway point. In those instances, I don't mind it. Obviously, that's not the case here. Although I have to say, to me, one of the most emotionally powerful moments is in the final 10 seconds when you see the interview with Bill 20 odd years later, and then you get that title card that he committed suicide the night it aired. <sighs> that to me is the most emotionally impacting moment of this entire film. And it's buried in the last 10 seconds. And I know that it's there to leave you with a lasting impact and to think about the events of the film deeper at the end. But to me, I would have rather this story really, really been about him. Like, really just taken it from Bill's perspective. As you say, if you don't know Fred Hampton, you're not going to know Bill. Give us more about Bill, because he really is the impact of this story. Like, yes, Fred Hampton was an untimely death, and it was due to Bill, but I, just give us more of that story to me. Mm. And there's, it's both, 
I, I yeah, I I could have stood to have more. Like although although there are personally, I do think there's Ed. I think it could be a shorter film. Um, I think there's a period. There's about a half hour period. I'm going to say two thirds to three quarters through, where it's a bit. A lot of the scenes are a bit samey. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and that's not to say that any of them are individually bad scenes. Um, yep. They're just a bit samey, I think. Um, so I wonder if either, yeah, you just make it a, a slightly shorter film or, and I'd be totally up for this, just really bury deeper into the psyche of Bill, yep. which is difficult to do in a, in a character who's, you know, he's not there as a true believer. It's this conflict of self-serving actions plus genuinely being drawn to this guy which it's hard i would i would think it's very hard to do on a page and is completely reliant on you're like oh someone's really gonna have to fucking nail this yeah as it turns out they had someone who absolutely could yeah yep i agree and sometimes as dumbledore says the hard path and the better path are the same path my friend wow (laughs) deep deep fucking shit (laughs) good good stuff from our guy (laughs) Al- What's his name? Albus? Albus. <laughs> Albus. <laughs> weird name. It is weird. It is, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, no shots to all the Albuses out there, but it's a weird name. <laughs> Do you reckon there are many Albuses? There's probably more I don't in the think last- there are. Probably more in the last 20 years than there were prior to, though, mm. right? It probably- It would have gone, like, in waves. People would have been like, oh, yeah, we like our guy Albus. <laughs> and then, like, oh, shit, no, we don't. And they're like, oh, no, wait, we do. What do, you, do you reckon there are more- probably, I reckon you could track Albus. <laughs> do you reckon there are more Albuses or Severuses? <laughs> well, I would think Severuses because people would have drawn inspiration from Harry, wouldn't they? Yeah, maybe. Because didn't he- isn't, isn't his kid- I but No, I think his kid is- No, I could be wrong here. From memory, I think it's James Albus Severus Potter. I think he has both ah, of them right. as middle names. Okay. <laughs> I, I could Haven't be wrong. Haven't read it, only seen it once, yeah, so don't, don't know. Please don't add us, Harry Potter fans, but I, I think that- Of which there are dozens. Oh, many, many, many. <laughs> so, it sounds like we're on very much the same page here, which really surprises me. I didn't see this coming at all. How are you scoring this film? Um, yeah, like I said, I'm totally positive on the film. I'm a seven, um, but like a, a good, strong seven. I, I'm also a seven, but I have to be honest, I, I was closer to a six than I was an eight. If, if Right, you know, I was probably closer to an eight than a six. Yeah, I think there's many, many, many things to enjoy about this film. The performances are definitely some of the best I've seen this year. Like across the board, there's not a bad member in this cast and everybody- really gives it their all to elevate. you know. And like I said, the words that are written on the page are already great, but they're really doing stuff to bring it up. So love the cast, love the cinematography, great direction. I, to me, it's just some narrative things, but certainly a recommend from us. Certainly. Yeah. We're being, yeah, like we're being picky. We let's, let's be clear that we <laughs> like the film. <laughs> all right. What are we getting to next week, buddy? Next week, we're going to chat about the upcoming Oscars. That's right. We'll be- and give our deeply uninformed <laughs> opinion. That's right. We'll be giving you our heart and our head opinions. Uh, always fun to do. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, busy couple of weeks coming up. We've got Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Pretty exciting. I mean, I cannot tell you how excited I am. Cannot wait for that. We've got a couple of patron requests on the horizon. One one that I've never heard of, The Passion of Darkly Noon. Do you know anything about that? I know very little. I know that it has Ashley Judd and Brendan Fraser, and that is all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, lot, lots of stuff coming up. And uh, hopefully back to some new releases, too. I mean, apart from Mortal Kombat, it seems like maybe studios are starting to release some stuff again. <laughs> Although things are also getting like Top Gun Two just got pushed again, so who, yeah, who no, that's true. Who knows? Yeah, Netflix will have something, won't they? Surely, surely. <laughs> All right. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchedathing at gmail dot com or we watched. I'm sorry, we watched the thing. Did I say that? <laughs> Oh, let me start again. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchedathing.com or wewatchedarthing at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchedarthing. Uh, if you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchedarthing. And we will catch you next week. 
Well, now it sounds like it's we watched like a H thing. Ah. Okay, I'll do it again. In the meantime, if you want don't do that, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Catch you all. Watch a movie, folks. What are you drinking, Bear? Uh, tea, mate. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. You healthy motherfucker.